This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again here on TruthFrequencyRadio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver. Great to be back with you on another Tuesday afternoon across this, the greatest nation that the world has ever seen, the United States of America, and we're be we're glad to be back with you going across this country and around the world here on this Tuesday here on Truth Frequency Radio. You know, a few weeks back, uh, we talked a little bit about Ted Cruz. We've actually been talking about him uh, off and on the last couple of weeks on this program. Uh, I mentioned it when he officially got into the 2016 presidential race, although uh, that was certainly no surprise to anybody that he got in. And I analyzed a little bit about some of the initial uh, speeches he did and comments he made upon entering the race and what I thought of him. And uh, of course, for those of you who are always joining us, we're always getting new listeners here, I would, uh, to bring you up to speed, I would tell you that thus far of the candidates who have gotten into the race, and there have been new ones come in all the time, Dr. Ben Carson's in it now, and uh, Carly Fiorina's in it, and uh, on the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders is now officially in it. And, and as an aside, you know, I, all my adult life, I've just wondered why Democrats have never just dropped the facade and run Karl Marx, you know, for president. And I guess with Bernie Sanders, they effectively have. I think the guys will, will tell you to your face he's a socialist. Anyhow, even with these new uh, candidates getting into the mix, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about them over, over time over the next few weeks, Ted Cruz right now, as we stand here today on May 5th, 2015, Ted Cruz is at this point my favorite of the candidates. I'm not telling you that I'm going to necessarily vote for him at the end, there's a lot of uh, time between now and then. A lot of things can go wrong or go right. And there's a whole roller coaster ride of a campaign process that we go through. But if you were to tell me right now on May 5th, ask me right now on May 5th, 2015, who am I behind? If I had to pick somebody, I'm going to tell you it's Ted Cruz. That's where I'm at right now. Well, Ted Cruz recently made some comments that are going to make some Democrats squirm. And are going to make some people like me absolutely smile from ear to ear. Because as Cruz seems to have the affinity for doing, he dismisses with the political correctness, he dismisses with the uh, high-minded language, and he tells you the truth as he sees it. That's the impression I get of him, at least to this point. And he recently made some comments about our esteemed President of the United States, Mr. Barack Hussein Obama. And I'm taking this from rawstory.com, although I know it's been reported a few other places. The headline of this story is Ted Cruz blames Obama, saying the first black president has inflamed racial tensions. I'm going to take from this story a little bit here, talking about Cruz uh, speaking at the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce event in uh, Washington last week, I believe it was, taking a paragraph from this rawstory.com article, Cruz said that Obama could have chosen to be a leader on race relations, but instead, quote, has made decisions that I think have inflamed racial tensions, that have divided us rather than bringing us together, end quote. Now, that phrase, that line is without any doubt going to just send some liberals and even even some folks who aren't connected to politics on a day-to-day -day basis it's going to absolutely send them up the wall there are people out there I, I have no doubt there are people out there who will claim that it's out of bounds to accuse Barack Obama some might call him the president I don't really like to do that Oh, let's call him Barack Obama, Barack Hussein Obama. I'll leave that title off of there if you don't mind. There are people who would claim that accusing Barack Hussein Obama of inflaming racial tensions is out of bounds in some way. 
There are those who would say that it's uh, a little bit over the top, that he can't possibly be blamed for the racial discord that we're seeing in our nation now. There are even some, I suppose the more extreme variety, on the left-hand side of the aisle, there are even those who would likely claim that because Barack Obama is African American, he cannot possibly inflame racial tensions. It's a whole mindset that some of those liberals have that if you are a minority, you cannot possibly be racist or you cannot possibly inflame racial tensions. So that's going to be the reaction from some quarters. But to those people who would criticize Ted Cruz for accusing Barack Hussein Obama of inflaming racial tensions and making things worse in our nation in that regard than, than he's made them better. I would offer you this question. Or maybe, maybe it's not so much a question, it's a mental exercise. I would offer you this mental exercise and, and, and take you through this and, and see what you think of it. I want you to imagine a few things, if you would. I want you to imagine the presidency, the, uh, I hate to call it a presidency, but the, uh, the term and a half, if you will, of the Barack Obama administration. I want you to imagine that. And imagine if a few things during that administration would have went a little bit differently. Imagine if you would. What would have happened if Barack Obama, being the oft-mentioned first black president in American history, first African-American president, being historic in that regard, imagine what the reaction would have been and how much it would have said to America if he would have criticized Henry Louis Gates Jr., the Harvard professor, for Gates' disrespect of the police in his altercation with them. You know, when uh, they were called to his house because of some suspicious activity. And, of course, it was Gates getting into his own house, so, that, you know, that it was a suspicious activity. But when the police got there, Gates did not cooperate, and he talked back to them, and, and he gave them trouble. Imagine if Obama would have criticized Gates for that. So imagine... What message that would have sent? Imagine the message it would have sent if Barack Obama, the first African-American president in American history, imagine the message it would have sent if Obama would have praised George Zimmerman for doing his best to protect his community and protect his neighborhood. And imagine the message it would have sent if Barack Obama Instead of saying if he had a son, he would look like Trayvon Martin, if, if Obama had instead criticized Trayvon Martin for attacking George Zimmerman while he was protecting his neighborhood, if you'd have criticized Martin for getting on top of Zimmerman and pounding him ground and pound MMA style, punching him to the point that Zimmerman's life was in danger and forcing Zimmerman to defend himself with lethal force, imagine... If Barack Obama would have come out at that time and said the actions of Trayvon Martin in attacking a servant of the community are unacceptable, imagine the message that would have sent. Imagine just last fall if Barack Obama, our first African-American president, historic as that is, Imagine if Barack Hussein Obama would have criticized Michael Brown for robbing a liquor store and attacking a police officer, criticized him for attempting to take his gun, which, by the way, has now been proven at every level of investigation of the Michael Brown case. Imagine if Barack Obama would have praised Darren Wilson for doing his best to protect not only himself, but the community he was serving and would have criticized Michael Brown for his disrespect for law, property, order, and authority. Instead of pretending that Ferguson protesters had so-called legitimate concerns, imagine instead if Barack Obama were focused on the crime that plagues the inner cities, which causes all of this police interaction, instead of focusing 
on that interaction itself and, and leaving the impression or giving the message to people that that police interaction is problematic in and of itself. Imagine if those things would have happened. Because if you stop and really think about it, had Henry Louis Gates Jr., Trayvon Martin, or and or Michael Brown been white, they should have been criticized for their actions, and, and would have been criticized for their actions, and rightfully so. If Henry Louis Gates Jr. had been a white Harvard professor whom the police had come to his house when there was a question of whether he should be there or not, and instead of cooperating with the police, would have backtalked them and tried to cause a scene, he would have been criticized and should have been criticized. If Trayvon Martin had been a young white man who instead of cooperating with a neighborhood watchman decided to attack him, he would have been criticized. And again, should have been criticized. If Michael Brown had been a young white man who robbed a liquor store, attacked a police officer, went for the police officer's gun, we, on all aspects of society, would have criticized him, and again, rightfully so. So if you're truly colorblind here, it's very difficult as a member of a civilized society, as, as a, someone who believes in the rule of law, someone who believes in property rights, someone who believes in taking the fight to criminal behavior, it's awfully hard to look at any of those three people and back them up regardless of what their ethnicity is or anything else. So imagine if Barack Obama would have reacted that way. Had they been white, society would have demanded criticism of them, and, and, and rightfully so. So imagine if Obama had treated them that way. Imagine if Barack Obama would have treated Gates and Martin, and Brown, in that manner. What would it have said? What would it have said that the first African-American president in history, historic as that is, would have looked at some high-profile cases in which African-Americans, in those three specific cases anyway, had run-ins with the police where they were in the wrong, what if Obama had looked at those cases and said, you know what, Henry Louis Gates, you were out of line. Trayvon Martin was out of line. Michael Brown was out of line. What would have happened? What message would that have sent? What would that have done for race relations in America? Well, I would suspect and I would expect that had Barack Obama reacted in that manner, had Barack Obama reacted in a much more appropriate manner in these three cases than he did, that it would have sent a loud and powerful message to all of the American people. Whether you agree with Obama's policies or not, it would have sent a loud and clear message that we are a nation of laws, we are a nation of the rule of law, we are a nation that respects property rights, we are a nation that does not have two sets of standards depending on what skin color you are or how oppressed you claim to be. It would have sent the message that we're all playing under the same rules. It would have sent that message, and a powerful message it would have been, that we all are held to the same standards, that we all have the same responsibilities. It would have been a message that's as close to true equality as you would be likely to hear from any politician of any political stripe, of any party, of any political philosophy. How powerful would that have been? How powerful would it have been for Barack Obama to say in three, these three cases, and in Baltimore, and in other cases, that whatever your grievances may be, whether they are real or perceived, that you do not break the law in the name of your grievances. 
that you instead address those grievances through the system because you live in the greatest nation in the world that affords you the opportunity to do so. What if that would have been Barack Obama's message? Imagine it. I mean, I hate to quote John Lennon. I was never a fan of his, but I feel like rewriting that Imagine song of his. Imagine no race baiting. Imagine the rule of law. If Barack Obama, the first African-American president in American history, historic as that is, groundbreaking as we are told it is, if he would have taken such a tone, such a tact, in these three cases, it would have gone a long way, I suspect, in fulfilling one of the major promises that he put out there back in his 2008 election. It would have gone a long way towards helping bring America together. Now, I'm not telling you we all would join hands and sing Kumbaya. Our nation is a long, long way from that. But we would have at least recognized that for whatever misgivings we have about this man, he would have at least believed and would have at least used his influence, his bully pulpit, if you will, to go back to those people that put him into office and, and give them the message that we have laws in this nation. You follow them. We have systems and ways to address grievances in this nation. You follow them. It would have established a bond of trust not only between Barack Obama and his detractors, but also between, dare I say it, people of different racial backgrounds, economic backgrounds, geographic backgrounds, what have you, it would have gone a long way towards establishing a universal set of principles, a bridge, if you will, between those cultures that we can only dream about today. Instead of our continual focus on race, instead of our continual focus on a history that the vast majority of us, black, white, or whatever, have never lived through and never been affected by, we would instead have turned to more of a societal focus on the law and whom is breaking it. Rather than the parade of attention on race, which has been little more than a giant straw man, and a huge false flag argument. The bottom line is this, and Barack Obama easily could have said this multiple times during his, during his administration. He's had ample opportunity to do it, and he's missed it every time. But the bottom line is, if you break the law and you find yourself in a confrontation with police, we as a society really shouldn't care very much what happens to you. Or at the very least, what happens to you should be a far lesser priority to us than the protection of lives of innocent people and the protection of property. What a powerful message that would have been. That for whatever grievances we claim to have, whatever differences we convince ourselves that we have, the law applies equally to everyone, just as it was designed to. Barack Obama didn't do that, did he? Barack Obama claimed that the Harvard police acted stupidly. You know, because following up on complaints that are phoned in is a stupid thing to do, I guess. Barack Obama said that if he had a son, he would look like Trayvon Martin. I'm not sure I'd be too proud of that. Barack Obama made the case that there are legitimate concerns, not only in Ferguson, Missouri, but with policing as a whole, when the data and the statistics would tell you otherwise. So when it comes to whether or not Barack Obama has bettered racial relations in the last several years, or whether he has inflamed them, I think it's pretty clear. He has inflamed them. 
Instead of bringing us together, he has taken the side of those who have broken the law. He has taken the side of those who have attacked police. He has taken the side of those who are attempting their dead level best to tear down the very pillars and foundations of this society, this great nation, this great culture that has been the best the world's ever seen. And he's taking their side. And I suppose we shouldn't be surprised after all. One of his campaign promises early on was to fundamentally transform America. You cannot love America and want to fundamentally transform it. That's impossible. But many people will tell you, and probably Barack Obama himself, that all these things we're seeing, Henry Louis Gates, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, this Gray, the Freddie Gray out in Baltimore, and any number of others, they're likely to tell you that this is all the result of supposed oppression of the urban community, which is the cause of all this. And those are the problems that we need to focus on. In fact, the last week, when you watch Baltimore, when you watch the news, when you watch whether it's a man on the street interview with a protester right after he throws a rock and some reporter puts a, a microphone in his face and asks him what he's doing out there, he'll tell you, we need jobs, we need focus, we need money. And if you go back to the TV studio and talk to some high-minded liberal academic, they'll say the same thing, but in more flowery language. That's what we're told causes all this. But is that really so? I don't think it is. First of all, the most obvious point I could make is if lack of education, lack of economic opportunity is causing all of this violence, all of this crime in our urban areas, and why don't we see it in our rural areas, many of which are every bit as impoverished, have even less money in terms of education devoted to them, have every bit of the economic disopportunity, if you will, as we have in the urban areas. I, I could take you right now. I, I take. I record this show in the St. Louis, Missouri metro area. I could put you in a car right now, and I could drive probably less than an hour in any direction of St. Louis, Missouri, find you a rural area, and demonstrate to you a lack of economic opportunity, a lack of jobs, and poverty. It's every bit as bad as you'll see in the St. Louis area. So if this lack of opportunity is the cause of all the violence. Why don't we see this violence in our rural areas? We don't. And more to the point, all of this poverty and violence is not an unbroken line going back all the way to slavery, the way that liberals will tell you. It's not true at all. Do you realize that there is a time in America where African Americans as a whole were really making some tremendous strides? Yes, there were. In 1940, poverty among black families was at 87%, but by 1960, that had reduced all the way down to 47%. In the years between 1936 and 1959, so roughly the same period of time, incomes of blacks relatives to whites doubled. The rise of blacks in professional and other high-level occupations was greater in the five years preceding the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than it was in the five years afterward. In 1940, 86% 80, of black children were born inside marriage, and the illegitimacy rate was around 15%. But by 2008, only 31% of black children were born inside marriage, and the illegitimacy rate was near 70%. This is information you can find in Walter E. Williams' book, Liberty vs. the Tyranny of Socialism. Also, Thomas Sowell, who's done a lot of great research and, and work in this field, has a lot of this information as well. You see, that's a part of American history. That's a part of the racial struggle that people don't really ever talk about a whole lot. Was that before the 1960s, before this focus on having the government step in, and correct all the problems, African Americans were doing a pretty darn good job themselves of fixing their own problems, assimilating into society, being productive, and being successful. So if you tell me, if 
you're sitting there in Baltimore right now or Ferguson, you're throwing a rock or you're throwing a Molotov cocktail or you're shooting at a police officer and then you're going to tell me it's because you don't have any other choice. I dare you to open a history book. Because the real story of history tells you something different. Barack Obama has fanned the flames of this false narrative that blacks and other minorities are oppressed and cannot make it without the help of government and without the money and property of those who have made it. That's what he has done for the last six or seven years. He's not the only person to do it, but he's been the most recent. But it's time to take an actual look at history, see the truth. And it's time for leaders like Barack Obama to criticize those in the black community that commit crimes and break laws and protest against the police and convince them that it's time to assimilate. It's time to join this great culture, the greatest culture the world has ever known. It's time to join with us instead of rebel against us and fight us. Because let's face it, for all, for all the problems they seem to have with American culture, they're living in the greatest standard of living that anyone in the world has. How many of those folks have iPhones, air conditioning, cars, computers? As impoverished as they supposedly are, you don't know how good you've got it. And it can be even better if you assimilate into the society. Folks, that's the first segment. We'll be back right after this. Again.